rightly pointed out, it's the fourth time we have hosted this Who Wins Awards and Why. We have all four winners with us today who are going to share with you the inside story of their projects, how they assembled their project teams, how they define their project goals, and how they align their real estate design and delivery strategies to meet those goals. Today, the call is split into three parts. First, Suzanne from the awards committee will give you an overview of the awards process. Second, Marissa will split us into two virtual rooms with two project teams each. When you enter the rooms, if you could um, put your audio on mute and turn off your videos and keep the questions coming in the chat. Each team will present for 15 minutes before a five minute Q&A session, which will be called out by the room facilitators, Bill, Richard, Lulua and Connie. And finally, we'll all automatically be pulled back into the main room by Marissa, where everyone will be given a 90 second summary of all four projects. Please note that the recordings from both rooms will be made avail available on the chapter website later in the day. So you'll all have the chance to see all four presentations. Um, and with that, please enjoy the show and I'll hand over to Suzanne, thanks. Great, thank you so much, Stephen. Um, so thanks for joining us, everyone. Uh, this is just such a wonderful way to uh, bring together uh, and culminate the winners of this, this, these really remarkable projects. Um, I wanna start out by saying that this year we received an extraordinary group of projects uh, uh, to judge. Uh, there, without exception, these were just wonderfully thoughtful, um, dynamic, and extremely well-executed projects. But we had to choose winners, so we, we did. Um, and uh, I'd like to review the criteria. Uh, I, before I do that, uh, I want to also say something about the process. So typically, we, we shortlist projects, and then we go to tour the, those shortlisted projects. And I want to really uh, shout out to the teams this year, because with COVID, we we had uh, some real challenges and we did it virtually. Um, and without exception, people were uh, available and accommodating uh, clients, design teams, uh, project teams in general, and we really, really appreciate that. So in regards to the criteria, um, we really have uh, four main criteria. The first criteria is the story. The project should have a compelling story. It should be transformational for the business, the employees, and the community. The design should elevate, demonstrate, and celebrate a client's brand. Uh, second, we look to the employee experience. Um, has the project elevated the employee experience with a focus on health and well-being um, and, and uh, an acknowledgement that supporting human function and comfort ultimately elevates performance? It should be mindful to uh, access for all as well. Uh, thirdly, we look to sustainability. The project should have a point of view towards sustain, sustainability, whether or not it's LEED certified. How sustainable responsibility, uh, responsible materials and strategies are incorporated is one of our considerations. And finally, design excellence. The project should demonstrate a level of design detail and excellence. This includes attention to detail, consistency of execution quality, craft, materiality, color, lighting, and overall aesthetic experience. After all, design is about beautiful things. So that's definitely part of it. Um, so I, with that, I'll turn it over uh, and enjoy, enjoy the projects. Right, thank you, Suzanne. Um, Marissa, can you split us into the two rooms? Okay. The Lewis? Oh, there's Richard. Richard Lewis, yeah. are you going to kick us off? Uh, sure. First off, let me just say I'm impressed that, that this is working uh, from a technology standpoint as well as it seems to. Uh, Lulua, do you want to kick off? I think um, the Orion team, the Orion Resource Partners team, um, is going to go first. Um, 
So let's have them kick it off. Um, our speakers are Ariane from Emosa and Layla from Gardner and Theobald. Over to you guys. Uh, I don't see Ariane in this room. I didn't see her either. <laughs> yeah. And she has the presentation. I can, I'm happy to get started, but we won't get any pretty pictures. I'm going to make a call. You were overconfident there, Richard. Uh, yeah, I guess. Um, uh, Marissa right now. She said she's saying she got put into the wrong one. Uh -oh. <laughs> okay. Um, do we want to have the other team start if they're all here and then we hopefully she can jump in or do you want me to just no let, 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 let's try that if we may um are, are the other team ready to go sorry to um to rush you but <laughs> that would be the guardian life insurance team and our presenters are kimberly gregory um and arja Correct. And I, I just want to make sure I can't see everyone, but I just want to make sure we have our team. We, I see Greg and Kim um, and possibly Ted, if he's on here. We can Ted's go first. There. I, see, I see him. Okay, great. So we you are. See gonna... Andy, you see Andy, our job. I do see Andy. Uh -huh. and the um, All right. So uh, we are going to turn off our cameras and I will share my screen. Uh, give us one minute. <clears throat> Well done, thanks for stepping in. <laughs> All right, so please let me know when you can see my screen. Yep, you're up. Great. All right, so uh, we have about 15 minutes for this uh, presentation followed by Q&A. So we're gonna be short and sweet. Um, uh, this story is really about um, Guardian Life, which is a 160-year-old insurance company. And it's, it's, it's really about their transformation and reinvention. And um, throughout this presentation, we're going to point out factors that led them to leave uh, their facility in downtown Manhattan, Seven Hanover Place, and move to Hudson Yards. Um, so we have uh, the following people here who are the presenters for today's session. Uh, and I'm just gonna ask uh, everyone to just introduce themselves really quickly, starting with Kim. Sure, um, Kim Gruber. I'm the director of the workplace strategy and design team for Guardian. Hi everyone, it's Greg Smoke, head of corporate real estate. Uh, hand it over to you, Ted. Hi, Ted Uzlak. I'm the president with Fisher & Company, corporate real estate services firm that represents Guardian. And last but not the least, uh, I am Arjav. Um, I'm a senior designer with Perkins and Will and was the design lead for the Guardian Life Hudson Yards job. Um, so for the purpose of this presentation, we've divided it into three sections. Uh, Kim really will be talking to you about the business case, followed by Greg and Ted, who will be talking about the real estate story. And lastly, I will be touching up on some of the design features that helped uh, reinforce Guardian's brand and uh, transformation. <laughs> Throughout the presentation, you will be seeing visuals of the design. Yep, so with that, um, our Guardian New York City headquarters was previously located, as Arjav mentioned, uh, in 7 Hanover Square in the Financial District. We were there for nearly 20 years with over 20 floors of space. Um, that's 800, that was about 800,000 square feet or give or take. Um, after many years of planning, Guardian made the decision to move our headquarters, reducing our New York City footprint to just three floors at 10 Hudson Yards. And we really had three main goals in mind when it came to this decision to relocate. Um, we wanted to attract and retain talent by creating a modern workspace that would engage employees, promote flexibility, integrate technology, as well as our uh, integrating our new brand image. There was a desire by leadership to create a greater brand presence and visibility, and what better place to do that than Hudson Yards. Um, we also wanted to right size and modernize our headquarters. As you can imagine, 20 years in, the, in our previous location meant 20 years of stuff. Uh, we had hundreds of file cabinets, and I'm not even kidding about that. 
um, we had a dated and dark workplace that really needed to be brought up to our newer standards. And we had, we had already started doing uh, upgrading some and modernizing some of our other locations. So we just needed to bring our New York City headquarters up to our, our newest standards. In addition to that, we also had, uh, we have an increasing mobile workforce that um, with an, a successful mobility program, um, we call it Guardian on the Go. Over the last few years, we've uh, been moving to more of a mix of unassigned and assigned seating based on uh, our occupancy patterns. And we wanted to make sure that was addressed in our new, uh, new layout. So next slide, Great. please. So these are really some pictures uh, showing, you know, what we did with this space. And to Kim's point, uh, their previous space was dingy, was dark. There was a lot of gray. Um, now they're in a building which has, you know, floor to ceiling windows. We have a raised floor. So all of the heating is coming through the floor. Uh, we don't have large convectors. And so the, the whole point of this was bringing in daylight, bringing in views, uh, all of the offices on the interior with people at the window. Um, and, um, you know, uh, Guardian was compressing from 20 floors to three floors. And so, um, you know, we had to revisit a lot of their uh, standards, their space standards to, to fit this project. Uh, and Greg uh, will be talking a bit about this compression and what they did uh, in the next section of this uh, presentation, which is the real estate story. Greg, you're... Yeah, mute. Oh, sorry. Thanks, Arjav. <laughs> Ted, feel free to join me. Uh, as he, as Arjav and Kim have mentioned, <laughs> um, and I really appreciate the the kind of transformational intro on this. It was a confluence point for Guardian. We were in this building that was 20 years old. It was everything you could think of in terms of uh, um, a very tired building uh, with you know the high cubes and an executive four that had the pictures of every CEO that had ever been in the history of this company up on the wall. So it was like a, um, a trip through to uh, uh, the archives at the, the New York Met when you went up to our boardroom. Um, and it only got used a few times a year. And we just realized we had 840,000 square feet. We had 1,500 employees. We were subleasing a substantial portion of this headquarter building. It was a 20 year old lease and it was time to make some decisions. Uh, the convergence was that Guardian had just launched a new brand. We decided that it was time to focus both um, on the external marketing of that brand, but also the physical reflection of that brand through our presence, through our buildings, through how we present ourselves uh, to our employees and to our clients. And we embarked on a strategy um, that included a uh, recognition that we had a substantial number of people living in New Jersey. Uh, we ended up coming up with a bifurcated strategy that uh, essentially had us exiting um, 840,000 square foot building, migrating ultimately to Hudson Yards to 150,000 square foot building uh, and another 90,000 square foot building in near, uh, nearby Homedale, New Jersey. So we reduced our real estate footprint in this plan by uh, over 600,000 square feet, about 75% of our footprint. Um, we went through an exhaustive uh, marketing uh, site search, um, ended up through our network, finding a unicorn in terms of a sublease opportunity at Hudson Yards that Ted can talk about, and um, literally employed a team, a very small team of senior most executives to help us make a very quick decision in conjunction with Perkins and Will, who is providing us design guidance. Um, but Ted, I just want to check and see if you had anything to add. Sure, thanks, Greg. Um, so this is Ted Uslock speaking. Um, I think to Greg's point, the uh, the leadership team, we were looking throughout the New York, New York market in uh, financial district and uptown, and then leadership really wanted to focus on Hudson Yards as a possibility. So we investigated, um, there was no space available, the time frame for the new buildings coming on, um, we're not gonna meet our, our uh, time frame or our schedule, if you will. And so we created an opportunity with Coach, now known as Tapestry. We got executives from Guardian involved immediately with the executives of Coach, as well as related the landlord, because we want it to be a, um, it, it's a big project. It's a headquarters project. There's gonna be a sublease involved. We created some additional space that was not originally available with Coach. Um, 
and really um, put together, you know, kind of a, a, a quick overview with the executives and then went to work behind the scenes um, as you do in transactions like this to, to get all parties from a financial standpoint and from, um, you know, papering up and leases and subleases and all that type of thing. But it was a totally a collaborative effort um, and one that, um, you know, all, all parties, all three of the parties worked diligently on. And then as Greg said, you know, you get the, um, the, the, the approvals and then you go execute and start, you know, doing the fun stuff, building out the space. Great. So um, was, was, was there a, a branding component to that as well? Is, is there um, greater visibility for Guardian, again, for both employees and customers? Our job, I think you're in the perfect position to talk to that. So I'm going <laughs> to touch upon that. So one of the, so the decision was made that we are moving into 10 Hudson Yards. Uh, we were on board. And the biggest design challenge we had was uh, the visibility. If anyone's been in 10 Hudson Yards, and if you see the lower stack of the building, do you see my cursor? Um, it's really yep. branded for tapestry, right? Like a, right. it's a fashion brand, you know, they have all of their products out there, their big logos, a big screen. And uh, Guardian really didn't have much of a presence. And so one of the things we did, these three floors up here are the Guardian floors. You have tapestry below and uh, one floor above is tapest tapestry's cafeteria. Uh, so we were sandwiched in and we wanted to differentiate Guardian from the rest of the floors. Hence the, uh, the design intent really was to change up the lighting so Tapestry has a very warm lighting in their spaces and it's a lot of indirect lighting. Whereas with Guardian, what we did was the color temperature of the lighting is slightly different. So in the evening, you can, you can see the floors, they look slightly different. And also uh, we created some big features uh, which are lit up in the evening to distinguish the Guardian floors from the rest of the stack. For example, if you see this image, this is a, a two floor high chandelier. It's about 12 feet. It's hanging and it's lit up. So in the evening it glows and this facade actually faces the high line. So when you're on the high line and you look up, you can see the chandelier right here in the corner. The other thing we did was we have a um, illuminated wall which is on all three floors of uh, the project. And back here is the atrium. So through the atrium, when I go to that picture again, what you'll see is these top three floors have a light glow coming from those walls right there, which further emphasizes the presence of Guardian in the building stack. Um, one of this building sits right on the high line. And so one of the things in terms of design we also did was we wanted to consciously bring the outside in. And the way we did that is, you know, with the high line, you, you're walking through this, uh, you know, elevated uh, landscape garden, and you have these moments of respite where you are made to stop and you see certain views looking out into Manhattan or New Jersey. And so we sort of wanted to bring in a similar concept into the design of this space. So right from when you get off the elevators, there is this lighting concept that draws you into the space, but it is also highlighting some of these views. So that view over there is really off the Hudson River uh, and that's what it's highlighting. Similarly, this is their executive conference uh, zone and between the conference rooms where we have a breakout area, we intentionally created a portal, which then highlights the view looking into the courtyard of the Hudson Yards. So that's where the vessel is, the Heatherwick building. Uh, with their pantries, uh, not only uh, did we want to bring in some of their new brand colors through the, the finishes, but also create similar frames through which you're looking at the views outside. So that was the uh, most important design concept for the interior. But all of these, like the bigger ones are also visible from the outside. So this is the view and the high line is just perpendicular to this terrace. Uh, and then 
lastly, one, one of the other things we did, Greg mentioned that we, um, you know, the old space had a full floor dedicated to the conference center, which was primarily used by the CEO. And uh, they had uh, about two floors of corridors where they had these big um, portraits. These are oil on canvas portraits of all of their ex CEOs uh, that were on these uh, walls. And we didn't have the real estate nor did we have the walls to put all of these frames up because there's so much glass and transparency. Um, and so what we did was we came up, uh, we digitized all of those portraits and came up with this history wall idea where uh, it's interactive and you can go to any of these uh, screens and uh, click on a, on a button and it shows you the, uh, the portrait of the executive as well as it gives you a little bit of history on the making of Guardian, on the role of this person in the history of Guardian. So it's very well received. And, um, and also we compressed uh, the conference center. So now the conference center is a third of a floor and it's not just used by the uh, CEO, it's also used by everyone else. So there's also a flexibility component to it. So, you know, all of these features really helped us um, to build in flexibility into the space, adaptability. There's, uh, you know, we have raised floors, so changing up furniture is going to be fairly easy if they need to make changes in the future. Uh, and lastly, this is, this is probably the last slide. Uh, what I wanted to say is, you know, this is an example for us of how a well thought out strategy and design could really help change uh, the future of an organization. So let's let, let, let's jump into Q and A. Uh, I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna use my position to start, and then uh, anybody the only person that's put up a question so far is Tommy in the chat. So anybody who has uh, other questions, uh, please go to chat. Um, uh, in the context of attraction, uh, retention, and performance of employees and customers. Uh, this is something we've seen in other previous award winners. What 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 would you all say is the, the reception if you differentiate between the younger employees and the more senior leadership, many of whom had probably been at Hanover Square for you know ten or fifteen years? Uh, so how do, how is it received from with our because yeah. we do have a, a range of you know of different generations at, at Guardian so um, I think in all people were uh, overall people were proud of their workspace um, because we came from like we said um, a space that hadn't really been updated in 20 years <laughs> so so it was really hard to see people um, it was really you know you you walk on a floor and we had these high panel cubes and you could kind of not really see who was even there so um, I think having it more open and being able to see people there was more of an energy but I mean I'm I I'll be honest there you know there was a few people that were you know I think at first a little hesitant to the more open plan and more you know modernized thing but I think overall um, it was actually well received uh, great so the only question we have in chat so far is from Tommy and he asks was there an exorbitant loss factor in this space uh, the usable, the rentable loss, <laughs> loss factor. Um, yeah, I think, and, and I don't think that's uncommon for any New York City high rise. I think if Greg and Arjav want to jump in, but. I it was, they're... it was pretty high, uh, but as you saw, um, what, what we were faced with was, um, you know, we had an opportunity to go into this building and, and really decide to downsize from, you know, uh, <laughs> I don't know what you want to call it, a Ford excursion to a Prius type of footprint for us from a corporate real estate perspective. And the atrium and some of those features that you saw were previously built out by coach. So we, we learned to figure out how to creatively make these spaces as functional as possible. But I'll be honest, when I did my math, it's uh, 150,000 square feet and the, the usable is just about 90. So the loss factor is close to 40% in this footprint from uh, rentable to usable. And we decided that uh, it was important to us that we recognize the, the opportunity in terms of the way our workforce was already highly mobile. Um, and I, I, think, I think the one thing I wanted to share just in terms of lesson learned for us, we, in the, the, that whole analogy of trying to put too many pounds of stuff into a bag that's too small, 
we were pretty scared. We had 1500 people and we were trying to accommodate them. You know, if you do the math, <laughs> they each had close to 600 square feet assigned to them at our corporate headquarters, including some of the sublease space. Um, and here we were trying to get well below 200 by New York standards with this loss factor. And we, we pulled every lever we could. We took advantage of, um, you know, if people wanted to consider working from home, if they wanted to consider working at other campuses, they wanted to consider early retirement, if they wanted to consider being more mobile and not having to come in every day and, and, and then ultimately seat sharing. And we still, even, you know, on moving in, we really thought that this was going to be a problem because it's a New York headquarters and it's a, it's a nerve center. All of our employees tend to converge here. It turned out, you know, the lesson learned for us was we were scared of something that never really manifested itself. Um, we, we never really got to a point where uh, it, it was impossible for people to find seats. Um, the one lesson learned out of it was that when we did do this mo mobile migration of this 160 year old company, we, we kind of drew, drew the line at some of the executive offices um, and allowed some of those more senior folks to have dedicated space. If I could do it all over again, uh, if I could wave a magic wand, I would have loved to have seen us uh, go all in on mobility. Uh, but it was a huge step for us forward to get close to 70, 80% of our employees into, into that unassigned mode. So I, I characterize it as our journey continues at this stage. So next, next question, actually on a related note, for those that are not uh, commuting back and forth to Hudson Yards, how, how are they finding the commute? Uh, between the, the, the single subway, I guess the ferry, and driving, I guess. I mean, Arjav, you're New York based, uh, and Kim, uh, do you want to take that one? Yeah, I, um, we did do a lot of um, analysis on commute times and stuff for our employees. Um, and there was there was some give and take. I think it was, um, you know, we, we did, you know, um, I think there were some employees that were, had a better commute, obviously, to lower Manhattan. And I think there was there's some employees where it was uh, improved. So I don't know. I think it was sort of a 50-50 a there. Yeah, I mean, for me, and again, I don't work at Guardian, but a uh, location like Hudson Yards is just, uh, I live in Midtown on the east side. So the seven train is right there. And, you know, it gets me there in like seven minutes. So it's, it's pretty uh, well located. Um, and the one thing I, I will say, I will give credit to Guardian on, on really emphasizing the need of a cafeteria in, in the space, whereas all of us were of the mindset that, oh, you're gonna have so many restaurants open up you know, around the neighborhood. Why do you really need a full cooking kitchen in your space, especially when you, know, you are downsizing so much? And, um, Right now, especially with COVID, when you see a lot of these restaurants and like malls right next to the building that have completely closed off, they still can function without any of that. Uh, and and I will say a huge credit goes to them for, you know, just standing their uh, ground on that and going ahead with a full cooking kitchen. Uh, next, uh, what uh, Rich, Richard, Richard, I'm yeah. sorry, we're going to have to swap to the other team. Be fair to the other oh, team. Yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll automatically get pulled into the main room at 20 yep. past. Yep. Um, Stephen, can I just say one more thing? I, yeah. I just want to say that, you know, um, Guardian has been one of the most progressive uh, insurance companies I have worked with personally in my experience. And I really hope that more and more clients do this in the future. Uh, because it's it's exciting for designers uh, when a client has a vision for good design and um, and mobility and agility in their uh, offices. So yeah. thank you. Thank you, Arjav, and, and look, brilliant project and, and brilliant team and a great presentation. So thank thank you very much. Um, we just need to move on. <laughs> so with that, Ariane, could you take control, please? Will do. Are you able to see my screen? Not quite yet. Yes. There we go. Right. I think. Hi, I'll everybody. I am Leila Jada from Gardner and Seabold, the project manager on this project. And I'm, thank you for the brief introduction and kicking this off, Ariane. Um, 
I'll just jump right into it and say that um, I would I would say that one of the greatest um, or the most important parts of a successful project is the project team. Um, and you can see all of the different consultants that we work with, um, that myself and Ariane from M. Moser work with on this project, um, along of course with the great consultant team would also be a great client, which in this case was Orion Resource Partners. Um, and they were a great client um, for many reasons. Um, I think one of the most important ones was that this was their first time ever doing a project like this. Um, and so they really looked to everyone on the project team, um, you know, for, you know, for their input. They really appreciated that all the knowledge the team had to bring in um, and they really wanted to learn and, you know, they appreciated and really listened to everyone as their advisors. Um, so it was a great, um, it was a great force bringing everybody together. Um, <clears throat> so that being said, like I just mentioned, they, um, they were located at 1211 Avenue of the Americas. Uh, Ariane, do you want to jump to the next slide? Um, they were at Avenue of the Americas and um, they, um, their lease was expiring. That being said, uh, they were in a pre-build space that the, you know, they had just taken over from the landlord and they really, you know, just kind of moved in and fitted into this existing space. They didn't have the opportunity to um, build it out themselves. So they really wanted an opportunity to design a space that was tailored to their specific needs. They also um, have a big, you know, a brand and a culture that they really wanted to show off within their space. Um, and then they also have, you know, wanted to bring in a curated visitor experience. Um, just as important of that, um, as the curated visitor experience was showcasing the, you know, their, um, you know, what their employees' interests are. And a big one was um, their love of ping pong. So um, this was a very, is a highly utilized space. Um, this one was a big one for them. So it was um, designing a game room and they actually had this at their last space. They had taken over an empty storage room and there was, there was literally holes in the walls from all the ping pong balls that had been um, bounced around in there. Um, so in addition to, you know, creating this like beautiful front of house, you know, client experience, they, they really wanted to, you know, show how important the needs and um, desires of their employees are. And so that was um, a big, interesting part of this project as well. Hi, just as a brief introduction, my name is Ariane Beaton and I was uh, the lead designer while Layla was um, our project manager. Um, and in thinking about the the real estate decision, um, they, you know, Layla mentioned that, you know, they, they wanted to kind of start fresh um, with the space. And when they looked at a, a number of different sites, uh, they really wanted to stay within the Times Square area, um, Bryant Park. Um, at just, you know, considering commute um, and also kind of being in the action, if you will. Um, so uh, uh, Brian Park felt a right to them. And then a large part of that was also thinking about uh, a single uh, floor plate. So, uh, you know, finding the right building that could suit that need, but, and also even thinking about uh, today um, and considering COVID and uh, reducing um, shared spaces as well. So this still holds true. Um, and you know that that footprint fit perfectly within Seven Bryant Park, which you see here. And uh, you know this iconic building. You can see that the main draw here is this uh, feature cone. Um, so this is something that you know while, while we move into the design, uh, really wanted to to celebrate that. Um, and if we kind of proceed on and kind of just take a glance at the plan. Um, one thing that I would say feedback that we received uh, as the, the design firm um, in kind of uh, why they, they chose us um, was that we really wanted to work with this uh, design element. Um, and it, it, you know, was the main draw, you know, has unbelievable views um, to make sure that it uh, served the employees as well as um, the guests. So, you know, when we think about this really curated experience um, coming from imme immediately off of the elevator lobby um, from 
sorry, <laughs> from A to Z kind of being immersed within their brand. And we'll touch on that a little bit later, kind of the specifics around that. Um, you know, you go through reception and, and there's kind of this, this impact and which we'll see. And then, you know, even in the, the pantry itself and thinking about um, the employees having the opportunities to see this as well as, you know, this uh, client conference area, this dedicated client conference area. So um, emphasizing that the, the, the main importance was that there were kind of these, um, you know, central areas for the employees to gather, uh, as well as, you know, um, having a place that they could be proud of to bring their um, clients moving forward. Um, and even today, you know, what, what's the reason that people are going to keep going to the office? And we believe a lot of that is, you know, for them in particular, is, you know, having a place to showcase for their clients. Um, and then just to kind of emphasize here, uh, as we kind of go through the, the images, is that these are kind of the areas we're highlighting, um, which, you know, one of them being right here along this, this client journey um, is uh, this intersection where you're, you know, there's this monumental feature that, again, speaks their brand and identity. And um, so just to kind of back up a little bit. Uh, so Orion Resource Partners is a uh, financial firm, but they're really unique in that they uh, trade, they invest in mines and they trade metals. So, you know, when we started the conversation with them uh, and kind of, you know, getting to know them a little bit more uh, before jumping into the design, they had just such immense pride in who they were and what set them apart from a tra traditional um, finance uh, company. So, uh, you know, we, we knew that, that it was going to be really, really imperative to uh, have each, each space within um, the office, um, you know, feel like them. You know, wherever you were, you could really sense the, the, the mind having this, this industrial feel to it, um, still clean and tailored, um, you know, because they want to, you know, have a, a, be able to showcase the space. Um, but, you know, this, this use of mixed metals, um, you know, so one of the, th the things that we wanted to touch on was the process. So the process of mining, which we learned a lot about, which is really, really exciting for us. Um, and part of the process, you know, we have showcased here, we created this display, which is the beginning of the process. So you, as you enter the space, you can see uh, where it all begins. So here you see, we kind of created these um, uh, cradles for the cylinders, which are called cores. So the core of who they are. Um, quite literally. Uh, and, you know, the, these cylinders are uh, specifically from their mines. Um, they gather them from a few different sites. So within these, these are extracted from the ground, if we think about the process. And um, uh, from that, you know, uh, refined down to the actual metal. So zinc, copper, gold lives within each of these metals, at least cores, which was really, really fascinating for us. And, and we thought, saw it as a really great opportunity to showcase that and also create kind of this layered effect uh, as you enter the space. So um, I think just, just throughout uh, our, our approach was just to keep that going and have little nods here and there um, as a reminder of who they were um, and have the space that they could be proud of. We also, um, further to that, um, we also focused a lot on really nice specific custom elements such as this um, pantry truss light fixture and even just some of the general fixtures throughout the space. You can even see the ones that are um, mounted up in the grid ceiling. You know, you know, they all tie back to Ariane's point, which is like, it's really telling the story about who they are. Like these light fixtures look like the ones that they have hanging in some of the mines um and just metals and different materials throughout that like really mean something to Orion um and then even in one of the you know the boardroom um we put in a very like custom unique um industrial looking boardroom table so taking these like really unique elements and features and putting them within standard spaces and you know, just normal rooms, but making their, you know, making a feature point and conversation point um, within all of these rooms to really, you know, tell their story. Um, and then, you know, being able to do that and you know, having these custom features, you know, we kind of offset that in the budget by you know relocating some of their existing furniture and other elements from their last space. We brought some of those over so that you know you could spend more and 
you know, in this one really nice table um, in this one really important room. Um, so just being able to make that happen for them by, you know, balancing at balancing at it out elsewhere within the project um, to make it work. Um, all that being said, I think one of the greatest things that we learned from this project and which probably can be applied to every project is um, the importance of pre-purchasing. So a lot of the, the light fixtures, office fronts, furniture, all of these like custom really, you know, nice touches that really bring a space together. Um, you know, we wanted to make sure that we got all of this stuff ordered um, and taken care of way ahead of time. So there was no surprises on site. Um, and then I think, of course, this could be applied very specifically to this one um, element, which is um, an actual steam hoist that they relocated from um, from one of their mines in Arizona. And we actually probably pre-purchased this slightly too early because um, it then arrived much quicker than we thought. And then it was like, well, where do we, how, you know, house something like this while the state, you know, like construction is still happening. Um, and there was just so many moving or different parts and pieces and people that were involved in making this happen, just, you know, getting it to site, storing it in a warehouse in Queens where, you know, they host, where they house, you know, sculpture and art, bringing it to site, having a structural engineer review it, and then just making all of these like really unique, specific, intricate pieces come together in a timely and efficient and practical matter. Um, and uh, I think this kind of really speaks to the entire project and Orion themselves as a whole. So I saw that we got a warning, the five minute warning over here. <laughs> um, thanks, Layla, for kind of you know, wrapping it together. Again, coming mm -hmm. back to this, this central element um, the, along the kind of the journey um, to speak to who they are. Um, just want to make sure we have time for questions before we get kicked out. <laughs> Yeah. All right. On the preparation call, did you talk to um, taking the entire floor that that was a preference on the real estate side? Yes. Yeah. We Something just... to add about that actually is that they are a smaller firm, like they only needed about 15, 16,000 square feet, which is pretty small for a full floor in Midtown Manhattan. So I think that's another thing that made this specific space and this building, you know, so unique and perfect for them was, you know, because of this cone, as you move up, um, it, the floor plates do get smaller. So that made it possible for them to find a full floor. Well, I think especially uh, around Bryant Park or on Sixth Avenue, there are very few small floors as opposed yeah. to going up to like Madison, exactly. 15 meter, right? Yeah. Um, uh, Tommy asked when, when, when was this completed and what was the duration of the design and construction? Completed in um, it was, yeah, I believe in May and March, April, maybe late April, early May. Um, and then I think, gosh, the entire process started, mm, when did it start? I want to say we were like interviewing architects in November of the year before, two years before. Does that sound right? Did they amend the space halfway through? Uh, did they redesign it all? Uh, I was asking because to see if it was affected by COVID. Oh, yeah. no, not affected by COVID. <laughs> no, yeah. And actually, it's very interesting to see that. Um, so when we did actually go go give the tour of this, they're actively using the space. They, they, I mean, at a lower capacity, um, but they're still in it. So they're COVID's not phasing them. <laughs> Good. Good to hear it. I got the green wall. Picking up on the COVID lead from Tommy, uh, if you had to do things differently today, uh, what would those be? So we kind of touched on a few different elements and and really that that is would not we wouldn't necessarily you know make any big changes um i think that again thinking about what what the workspace you know what holds true um and what each uh, different unique firm is really going to go to the workspace for and theirs is going to be to have that client experience and the space still serves for that so i think that's going to be really critical um that that they thought ahead you know even in thinking that that this is what we need we really need this this unique experience um, to be proud of. So we're gonna. Thank you. <laughs> so 
So actually, on a, on a related note, if, really quickly, um, what what was the design uh, specification occupancy per employee, sort of pre-COVID, and how are, how is the space being used now? How many square feet per employee before COVID, and sort of in action now? Um, tough to say now um, because they uh, th they're not changing. They're they're just you know I guess coming in as needed. Um, I don't know if they have a firm game plan. Um, and before I don't know what it was per. They had about I would say forty people within the space. So it was uh, definitely within the employee uh, employee area, and then they had eleven offices as well. Sorry, I don't have that number offhand for you. <laughs> okay, I'll just close. But they're definitely in there very comfortably. Really they were comfortable even before this. Yeah. Okay, great. Marissa, have we got everyone back? Taking their way back now. Okay, I'll give it another 30 seconds. And then Connie, are you going to take the lead on the first two projects? Um, actually, Ulua. Ulua is going to go first. Okay. Do we have Marissa, you back? just tell us when we're all back? <clears throat> you guys should all be back now. Okay, great. So, um, um, Lulu, I'll hand it straight over to you to give a summary of the first two projects. I'll take it on. Um, my break room had Guardian Life Insurance and Orion Resource Partners. Um, Guardian Life Insurance won the award in the 80,000 to 150,000 square foot category. Our presenters are Kimberly Gruber and Gregory Schmoke from uh, Guardian, Dad, Ted Uzilak from Fisher and Arjav Shah Perkins and Will did an amazing job on the project and um, shared that and articulated it well. After occupying about seven, after occupying seven Hanover Square in downtown Manhattan for nearly 20 years, Guardian Life Insurance relocated their headquarters, reducing the footprint from 80,000 um, RSF to approximately 150,000 RSF. Lulu, it's, it's 800,000 RSF to 150,000. That's, thank you, 800,000 to <laughs> approximately 150,000 RSF uh, when they moved to Hudson Yards. Um, Guardian desired to have a space that would engage employees and clients, integrate technology, and increase brand visibility for the 160-year-old institution. Uh, three main takeaways are engage leadership and get stakeholder buy-in early in the process. Don't be afraid to be bold and aim high. Attraction and retention was key and putting people first uh, for a memorable user experience was a priority. The end result is a dynamic space that integrates the latest technologies and has the flexibility to adapt over time for Guardian's evolving business needs. The second project winning team, uh, Orion Resource Partners. Um, the project was presented by Arian Witten from M. Moser and Leila Jada from Gardner and Theobald. Thank you both. Orion Resource Partners new office at Seven Bryant Park gave the organization an opportunity to design a 15,000 square foot space that reflected their culture and brand while creating a welcoming visitor experience. Key highlights and wins of the new office space are an office designed intentionally to showcase Brian's brand and pride for working with precious metal mines, Orion's unique culture, a curated visitor experience, and an office space that supported the company's growth. The design leveraged custom fixtures, finishes, and fix features to communicate the story of Orion's brand and incorporate tools used in mining to help carry out the theme of raw to refined throughout the office. Lastly, Orion's decision to keep private offices is also a nod to the practicality of a joint understanding of Orion's tolerance for change. Emosa worked with the COO, CEO, and founder to distinguish which offices are a business 
requirement, not just cultural entitlements, in order to balance progressive and practical aspects of the business. Congratulations again to both the winning teams for your stellar projects. Now on to Connie Van Ryan to cover the other breakout room. Hi, everyone. Thank you. Wait for the images. So I had the pleasure of listening in on the other group, which was the Vera Institute of Justice, uh, which is a nonprofit focused urgently on building um, and improving the justice system. They were started in 1961 and they were in the 35,000 square foot category. Um, on that project team was from the Vera Institute was Lydia Shelley, the Director of Workplace Services, Lauren Farrell from Denham Wolf, she's a project, senior project manager, and Sarah Schuster from Studios Architects. Um, this project was really about really embracing what Vera is all about and connecting them to their community, but also making it uh, a truly accessible space for their employees. And so they were currently in the Woolworth building where they had been for over 20 years and they had to make a decision, should they stay where, where they were or look at an alternate location? And through that process, they made the decision to move to Brooklyn to Industry City so that they were in a, uh, repurposed historic warehouse area in Sunset Park, um, where they could be closer to their community that they were serving, while still providing great accessibility for their employees. So they went through the traditional zip code analysis and on all those studies in a very accessible site. Um, accessible, in, it, not just in terms of compliance, but accessible in terms of the transparency of the space, the accessibility to their community, the engagement in the community in terms of the artwork that you see. This is all local artists embracing really what they stand for. So really key um, initiatives in terms of walking the talk and engaging the community. Uh, the space is, is um, all open plan. So they went from a very traditional environment to an open plan environment, which is serving them well in the post COVID world in terms of they've got operable windows. They have flexibility of the space, providing people choice. So the individual comes to work, they have the choice to decide how and when they want to work and in what type of environment. So again, um, it, very strong. When you walk into the space, you can understand what the mission is of the organization. And again, because of the new location, they can really engage their community and their employees can also enjoy the amenities of the new community. Um, very, you know, again, wonderful space really speaks to the core of the mission and um, it's a very important mission that they're doing um, and so th the second project was rockefeller capital management which um, is a financial services firm founded in uh, 2018 but it was really a relaunch of the john d rockefeller family office so rockefeller and company as you might uh, have known it um, and so with the formation of this firm, again, they were looking through what, you know, how does this space tie to our mission, more of a traditional space again, and really wanted to create a new brand for the company to attract and retain talent, increase communications across existing teams, flexibility of the space. So they went through a, uh, you know, quite a long site search, looking at a lot of spaces within Midtown what would make sense. There was a lot of financial firms shifting to Hudson Yards. Um, and so they went through and they looked, but um, at the end of the day, they came back to Rockefeller Center and to the um, international building there, which working with Cushman and Wakefield, sorry, just to back up the team, uh, it's Devin Wakeford, who's the vice president of real estate at Rockefeller Capital Management, John Serco from Cushman and Wakefield. Um, and then there's Therese Wilson, who's a partner, and Greg Weber, who's the senior director at LSM Architects. And so the working with CNW was really critical um, in terms of understanding what the building could provide for them. So, you know, it, competing with people who are moving to Hudson Yards, new builds, this space actually, uh, given the expertise of the Cushman and Wakefield team, understanding that there was the opportunity in LSM, understanding the opportunity to, to move to the fifth floor, a single floor, which had the um, ability to leverage the high ceilings there, the 14 foot high ceilings, and really uh, move the focus to this wonderful view of St. Patrick's Cathedral. 
So they really uh, looked at the floor plate in terms of uh, how they could leverage that, that vision, which again speaks to the Rockefeller uh, family and, and the history within New York. And so uh, they leveraged the, you know, the, the brick walls and they leveraged the, the architecture of the space and really um, you know, created the open ceilings so that they could showcase the 14 foot um, height. And, and also um, with the tighter footprint, it doesn't feel that you've really increased that density because you're, you're leveraging again the ceiling height. Um, so, you know, this space has really enabled them to engage, the, you know, their, their teams and the community again with the, with the local uh, architecture and really speaking to the mission of Rockefeller Capital. So both projects engaging what's there on the street in their local community, which speaks to who they are as brands, um, really successful projects, great work teams. Um, I'm sure I haven't done you enough justice, but thank you. Thank you very much, Connie. Um, Suzanne, do you wanna say a few final words on behalf of the awards committee? Sure, thank you, Stephen. Um, just that we uh, were so grateful for the quality of these projects and all those we received. Um, congratulations to the team and a call for entries for the following year. Um, that call will go out uh, in the near future and we really look forward to um, another excellent year, uh, which is just a ton of fun uh, to, to judge these projects. Um, really inspirational uh, and so, Tell your friends, tell your peers, submit, submit, submit. Thank Brilliant. you. Th thank you very much, Suzanne. So I see we're, we're, we're already at half past. So I'll just say well done again on, on behalf of everyone. Uh, thank you again for everyone who's put a huge amount of effort to prepare for this event um, and share your stories with everyone. Um, I'll wish you all happy holidays, um, but otherwise I'll hand it up to Tommy if he wants to say anything on behalf of the chapter. Enjoy the snow. Thanks, everybody. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Get the shovels out. Bye. Thank you so much. Holidays, everyone.